You're such a welcoming group. I feel very comfortable giving this talk. So um, I really appreciate just the chance to uh, share a little bit about what we're doing through the Adler Planetarium. You talked a little about the role of culture institutions in your own lives or what you see them doing. And for us, it's very much about how do we use the power, privilege, and resources we have through these cultural institutions, and ours is STEM-focused, uh, to empower the public in all the different possible ways we can. Um, this talk will focus on the Zooniverse side of my department. Um, the other side is the teen programs, and so I'll just make a note of the ways we're engaging predominantly Chicago's south and west side uh, high school kids um, in hunting for meteorites that fell in Lake Michigan, in launching high-altitude balloons, uh, and launching experiments into space on the back of some NASA anti-areas rockets. Um, but it's all about putting the teens in the driver's seat of discovery, ha having them feel the confidence, find their voice, um, have confidence in their perspective and their place at the table in STEM. Um, on the Zooniverse side, so this talk will be about the collaboration we've had over the past over a decade with the University of Oxford and the University of Minnesota and the ways we're working to engage the public in valued and meaningful ways in real research. And it's very much dependent on the technology we've been using to do that. So I'm going to start with a bit of the origin story uh, of why, why this online citizen science platform and what it is, or why we're doing it. So back in 2007, there was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this data set of a million galaxies. There were a few astronomers who introduced themselves, so correct me, all this stuff. No, I'm an astronomer, so I have this right. So a million galaxies, and that research team, all they needed to know before being able to really delve into the research was, for each one of those splashes of light, is that a spiral galaxy, an elliptical galaxy, or maybe just a star or artifact glitch in the image? And so, uh, so they started classifying galaxies. They're like, sure, we can do this. In a month, one of their grad students classified 50,000 galaxies, which is insane, which meant he didn't sleep very much. But that was just a tiny drop in the bucket of the many, many, the million galaxies that they needed just purely to classify. And they realized it would take longer than their professional lifetimes just to do that task, let alone the really interesting research you could do with that kind of data set. So Angry Birds was quite popular at the time. So they thought, what if we could harness the power of the crowd to help us with this data processing task? A thing that kindergartners to senior citizens are very good at recognizing patterns. And so they launched Galaxy Zoo. And in the first hours, they were getting 70,000 classifications an hour. In the first year, over 200,000 people participated. And this proof of concept that you could invite the public to help you unlock your data, which is really just do a data processing classification step for you, um, could then catapult you to actually doing the research um, together with the public. So since uh, that first data set, they got millions of classifications, retired that first data set, and have had over 50 peer-reviewed publications directly from that data, as well as sort of a, over 2,000 publications that are uh, a result of having that data set public. Um, major impact on the field of gal galaxy evolution. So this was the proof of concept back in 2007 of online citizen science. And since 2007, we've launched over 150 different projects across the disciplines where research teams have a similar data processing need. Uh, and it's all because of 1.7 million people around the world and growing who log on to the, the Zooniverse website, choose a project, and help classify those images. So I'll give a flavor of some of the projects, and then we'll get a little into the role of machine learning. So projects um, typically have this model where there's an image, audio clip, or video file that the research te team needs the public's help in uh, classifying, annotating, marking, or tagging in some way. So in Snapshot Serengeti, uh, it's a good project to explain how we get data reliability or data quality. So in Snapshot Serengeti, as with all the projects, multiple eyes, multiple humans look at every image. Um, here, there's 25 people who look at every image, and so if 23 out of 25 say, hey, there's an elephant and it's walking, you can be pretty confident in that result. Also, the research team uploads a subset of their data, in this case, a few thousand images that experts have classified, and then they compare the consensus results from the crowd with those expert classifications. In Snapshot Serengeti, 97% of the time, those agree, and in the 3% where they don't, half of the time experts can't agree with each other. So you'll have like a smudge in the background that might be the backside of 
who knows what kind of animal. Uh, and so it's uh, over the decade we've built up this uh, reputation where online citizen science, where you have kindergarten classrooms doing this and museum guests and um, you can get reliable and accurate and um, robust results. So projects uh, use that same process of consensus or aggregation, whether it's a marking task. So here you're looking for star forming regions in the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and so you take all the, the drawings and we've, over the decade, we've built up aggregation routines so that we can take multiple classifications even for drawing tasks and find the, the most uh, confident uh, consensus result. And what's nice with having a platform that's shared across the disciplines is we can learn lessons in our astronomy projects or in our ecology projects and apply them in other disciplines. So here we use that same knowledge we built up through the astronomy projects and apply it to a cancer research effort where volunteers are marking the nucleus of the cell. This is with the Crick Institute in the UK. Um, and then we take these same lessons learned and apply them into the humanities. So there's been a huge effort through museums, galleries, archives to digitize data. But it's one thing to have a scanned image of William Lloyd Garrison and his abolitionist network of letters. It's the other to actually have that data be searchable. So whether it's just tagging certain metadata that's needed or full transcription. Um, and here is a sort of recent effort we've been doing to allow a, a volunteer to see previous transcriptions choose ones that they agree with, edit them um, as they see uh, useful or best. And then, uh, dear to many of us who work in the team, our heart is that we apply these same tools to disaster relief efforts here on Earth. Um, so with Hurricane Dorian, we were able to upload satellite pre and post images, and then volunteers go in and tag them with where roads are blocked, uh, temporary settlements have been set up, and we partner with uh, Rescue Global, a humanitarian aid organization, so that they take the heat maps from these consensus results. And it's, it's crazy. Our 10, 000, over 10,000 volunteers have come to this project in the past week and provided the equivalent of two years of full-time effort in order to get this data processed as quickly as possible so that Rescue Global can then alloc uh, efficiently allocate resources on the ground. And it really makes a huge difference just in terms of that, that process. Um, so that one's called planetaryresponsenetwork.org. We're done with the data, but there may be a few more data sets that go on, so uh, come and help. Um, so uh, with data scientists, machine learning experts in the crowd, I thought I would talk a little bit about how it's one thing to have human classifications, but I'm sure you're looking at these images and you're thinking machines can do some of that effort at least. And so yes, very much. And key to just the usability, the real impact of online citizen science is that integration of human and machines. Um, so here's the Galaxy Zoo interface again. And, uh, and so we wanted to prove to ourselves that of course machines are gonna make this a more efficient process. So this is just a plot from a, an article from Melanie Beck in her work of looking at the second release of the Galaxy Zoo. So there was a data set of 200,000 galaxies that needed classified, classifying back in 2010. And so it took our crowd over 300 days to classify that data set. Um, and so in this experiment, she set a machine running after seven days of the human classifications coming in, and it immediately retired a bunch of the data. Um, and then over the subsequent 30 days, or 30 days total, it took that human machine system together to retire the entire data set. So that was a factor of 10 increase in efficiency, meaning it took uh, that many fewer days to make, uh, have the whole human machine system make its way through the data. Um, and a lot of our projects fall into this type of category where if you combine the human and machine effort, you have a much more efficient process. Um, much longer talk, I would give you lots of other examples, but what is interesting in this type of system is that while you do want a very efficient system, especially with these huge data sets that we have, like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope in astronomy is going to be producing 30 terabytes of data every night, a million objects of interest every night. It's, it's a massive amount of data. Humans and machines alone probably can't handle that amount. But if you only do it with uh, efficiency optimization in mind, you lose out on these serendipitous discoveries. So human eyes are very good at recognizing the weird, the unusual, the rare, and flagging them. 
And so Hanny Van Arkel is one of our volunteers. She's classifying in Galaxy Zoo, and then she sees this object. So the galaxy in the top is something a machine would have recognized, but it's that green glowing glob in the bottom that caught her eye. And so she flagged it to the researchers, and key for every project is that there's a discussion forum alongside the classification interface. So if a human sees something of interest, they flag it, they bring it into the discussion forum. It's an object-based discussion forum, so you have conversations about the, the objects that you see. You can also talk about your social life and the research itself, and it's really a key factor in keeping our volunteers engaged and getting something back for the effort they're putting in is engaging with the research team in this forum space. But Hanny flagged this object and she, she said to the research team, is this a glitch? Is this something cool? What, what could it be? And uh, it turns out to be a ghost remnant of a supermassive black hole outflow. So this is my area of research. It's uh, at the center of every galaxy. There's an intermediate or supermassive black hole. And if it's gobbling in material, it's going to shoot out high energy particles out into space, shock into the intergalactic medium, and glow. But it's a very rare event. Well, it's a very short-lived event. So it's a very rare object to see. There's less than a dozen of these that have been found so far in our many millions of galaxies. And so machines could never have a large enough training set to look for something like this, or even to know to look for something like this, until we train them up or tell them to do that. So key in any human machine system, at least for online citizen science, is leaving space for that serendipitous discovery, still having human eyes on the data, or using clustering algorithms to identify potentially interesting objects that should get review. But it's a really, it's a gnarly and fun problem for data scientists, it's really rich area to explore. Um, another sort of fun aspect of thinking about the design of the system is that, so machines are really good at identifying blank images. Uh, apologies to those who study grasses and trees, but those on the left are blank. Um, and so uh, you could, you would naively think, well, just remove all the blanks because you're trying to get at what the animals are doing. Turns out that if you leave in a certain fraction of blanks, you have a more efficient system because your volunteers will do more classifications if they have a certain fraction of blanks versus animal images. And we think that might be due to like the way slot machines work, where you're doing uh, work for intermittent reward, or it may just be cognitive load and they need that sort of respite between uh, classifying a lion that's chomping on one of the cameras or um, the types of images we see. Um, so again, uh, well, mainly the lesson there is that humans are complicated uh, and really good at seeing the rare and the unusual. And so you want to build into your system both for efficiency as well as the human engagement factor. Um, so for the last just couple slides, uh, key to just our general philosophy in Zooniverse is so all our code is open source. You can find it at GitHub, um, but also <coughs> Prior to 2015, we were launching around three projects a year, and it always took a major grant to support six months to 12 months of developer effort to create a custom platform to invite people into these, these research projects. And so we wanted to democratize access to the research tools themselves, so it wasn't just Harvard University that had a grant who could work with us to do this, but that Joliet Junior College could have their steel pan vibrations project with us just as easily. Um, so we were awarded a Google Global Impact Award and a Sloan Foundation grant to build what we called the Project Builder Platform. And so it's just a very simple browser-based interface where you upload your data, you upload your images and content, and, um, and that way you can build your own Zooniverse or online crowdsourcing research project. And once you've conceived of the idea, it literally takes about an hour to build. The, the hard part is really honing in on what exactly do you want your volunteers? What information do you need from them? Um, and how should you sort of lay out the tasks? Um, and so this is an example from, for those birders in the audience, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the eBird project, they partnered with us. And uh, so these are video clips from their webcams and tagging uh, bird behavior and calls. So we went from launching three projects a year to launching over 50 projects last year. Um, and really, uh, now it's in partnership with these research teams using the Project Builder platform to launch uh, their project. And uh, for any of you who, where this might be useful in your own work, uh, just know that you can have a project be private. Some research teams keep it more just as a standardized interface for marking their own data internal to their team. 
you can have a public project but only announce it to your own crowd or a public project that's promoted through Zooniverse. And you can also just take our code from GitHub and uh, do your own thing with it. Like the Field Museum has created a touch table experience where they took the code and sort of laid a new interface on top of it. Um, we also have a new Galaxy Zoo based multi person touch table experience at the Adler that's a ton of fun. Um, so in the past year, we've also launched a mobile app to go along with it. And this has been key with our machine learning efforts. Uh, so mobile is really good for uh, swipe type tasks. And, uh, and so you have uh, more or less like snapshot Serengeti Tinder, um, where you're like, is there an animal there or not? Yes, no. <laughs> um, and, uh, and all sorts of different project types that are native to the app. The, the app is built in React uh, Native. Uh, and our front end is React JavaScript, and our back end is Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Um, but, uh, so in the launch of the mobile app, we had 30% of our classifications coming through uh, the mobile, mobile app this past month. So that's over 800,000 uh, 800, classifications through the mobile app alone, and about over 2.6 million classifications through the whole site altogether um, per month. Um, so it's just a tremendous amount of effort uh, just people time that's going into helping researchers unlock their data. And it's just a really powerful way also of engaging the public in real research, sort of lifting the veil on how that works, what that looks like, um, what that community is like, the fact that researchers are humans and, uh, and so are volunteers. It's just uh, relationship building. So uh, thank you to, to the team. So my team at the uh, at the Adler Planetarium consists of six web developers, a designer, and three postdoctoral research fellows. Um, there's a similar sized team at the University of Oxford, and then we have our data scientists and machine learning experts really at the University of Minnesota, and then we partner with hundreds of researchers around the world who are leading these different projects and engaging with their volunteers, and then the 1.7 million uh, registered users who are helping us make this happen. Um, you don't have to register, you can just uh, participate without that too. Um, and then, so join in, and then I think I have a, yeah, I have a plug at that back. If you want to hear more, because 15 minutes is quite short, um, November 1st and 2nd at the Adler, Chris Lintot, the PI of the Oxford team, and I are going to be doing an immersive planetarium theater um, experience talking about all the, the really, uh, there's so many discoveries through Zooniverse that I couldn't touch on, but um, the surprises and discoveries and it all is what people can do from the couch at home. So thanks so much. Uh, this is really fascinating. I, I really thank you. Have you done any network analysis or, or geographic mapping of your, what, 1.6 billion uh, uh, volunteers to understand who they are, where they live, and so forth? Yes. So 50% are in the U.S., 20% in the U.K., and it's mainly because of those hosts in each place, and then 30% around the rest of the world. And it's in over 234 countries, based on the Google Analytics. I don't think there are actually 234 recognized countries in the world, but um, so in, in most countries in which there's access to the Internet. But a big part that is, there's so much opportunity. We know 1.7 million is just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of communities that could engage. It's really fascinating watching. We had a Japanese research team lead a project, and then all of a sudden we had this huge Japanese uh, community of volunteers who participate because of the local media and news and just community building there. And so part of it is reaching out to partners in other countries to try to grow that community. Um, and then part of it is also just having our own volunteers help us understand how best to reach others who would be interested in this kind of experience. There's also, there's a site called Listen to the Zooniverse, where it's just, we have a kinesis stream of classifications and locations where they're coming from, and so you can just see the map lighting up over time as just data is streaming in. Um, um, hi, I was curious about how you uh, do the consensus building. It seems like there's kind of a balance there between like wasting time, but still finding errors. So is that kind of like different based on the project and how does that work? Yeah, it's, um, so the simplest scenario is that you set your retirement limit at 15 or 25 or whatever number you realize you, you need. And then you just wait until you get those 25 classifications, say markings on a star forming region. And then you take all those raw results and you run the aggregation routine and you get that consensus. 
So there are much more sophisticated ways to use those classifications. We know a lot about our users, and in particular, their quality over time. We inject expert classified data where we know the answer. We see how our volunteers do compared to those expert classifications, and we upweight or downweight volunteers. And I have one uh, colleague on Galaxy Zoo who likes to say, if you're always wrong, you're actually just as useful, because we just like flip your answer. Um, <laughs> we don't actually do that. Uh, there's also, um, now that we have machine learning integrated into the system, so Galaxy Zoo is a good example where the machine is running and is actually starting to tell our system, hey, I need this kind of subject classified to learn most efficiently. And we know enough about our users to know, oh, that user is good at that potential candidate object. And so we send that subject to that user when they log on. Um, so there's an active learning system. We can also just, it's smart task allocation. So we know enough about our users that we're giving them certain subjects where a particular user can sort of skip a subject ahead to retirement because we know that their result, if it agrees with the consensus so far, then we can immediately retire it from the system and various things like that. Yeah. It's a fun, so we have a couple data science for good communities who have gotten interested in Zooniverse and there's been a few hack days where we sort of send them some of our data science needs. I mean, there's so much more work to do to refine these aggregation routines and think through smart task allocation possibilities and machine learning integration. So if that's ever something this community might be interested in, um, again, it's just such a rich playground to be in. Um, I'd welcome that. Hey, um, so I have kind of an abstract question because I've been in analytics and data science for like w way longer than I care to admit. Um, one of the blessings and the curses of this field as software has gotten better and, and more powerful and easier to use is that the promise has always been that uh, it gets so easy to build models that you know almost any idiot could build a model. And pretty soon you get idiots building models. And certainly that's not what you do, but, but you've got this wonderful, sophisticated software that b does these beautiful, just magnificent, intelligent things, and you've still got, it still requires a certain degree of sophistication to apply the, the to, to work with the software you've developed. But as you're deploying more and more of these projects, and, and it's growing so quickly as people identify just how, how cool it is, and how, how are you going to curate uh, the projects as they get deployed to maintain the high quality of the projects that are out there under really under your brand name? Yeah, so it's a key question. And in launching the Project Builder platform, the Sloan Foundation grant really was to think about community building, but also sort of the vetting process. And so our volunteers serve different roles. One is classifiers, one is being in the discussion forums, sometimes as m many as moderators, but another key role is project reviewer. So when a new project, so one to two new projects apply for beta review every week, and those first get vetted internally to make sure there's nothing pornographic or uh, un completely unacceptable. And then they get sent out to our community of project reviewers. 70,000 of our volunteers have said, I want to be a project reviewer and get these emails, um, inviting them to look at a new potential project and fill out a standard form of what to improve, what's working, what's not, is the research clear, is this appropriate for the Zooniverse platform, all sorts of feedback uh, straight to the research team. We help the research team go through that feedback and make sure that they improve and address what our volunteer, which is the sort of the consumer, the user community uh, of the platform. And so that has helped us um, just refine projects that come in quite raw sometimes and then make them so that they are ready for um, sort of keeping the, the standard and reputation of what a Zooniverse project should be for the full community. Um, a few of those projects, very, very few, don't pass through the, is this appropriate for Zooniverse? Because there's a few key principles. It has to um, be setting up uh, the research so that you are addressing a, a question and that could lead to publications and moving the research field forward. Because uh, our underlying motto is don't waste the volunteers' time. That's an incredibly precious resource. Um, and, and also, it's very important, just the trust that we've built with this community over the past 10 years is, uh, is a key part of what's sort of the special sauce of Zooniverse. So that, that vetting process is, is key, and it is led by our volunteers feeding back to us and to the research teams to make sure their projects are at the level they need to be. 
Another key part of the review process is the researchers use the data from that beta review, so volunteers are also submitting classifications during that period, and then they're making sure that their retirement rules, their aggregation process, all that data analysis uh, steps are in place and they're creating the data that they know will be useful for their research effort. Uh, so yeah, does that, I hope that answers. Yeah. Um, hey, I have a question. So um, I've worked on a project where we were actually building something that was crowdsourcing um, transcribed documents and so I saw that was one of your uses. Um, have you, you know, we actually ended up building our own thing, we probably should have just used yours. Uh, but have you seen other projects sort of try to sort of take the same model you have and start their own projects and sort of what do you do as far as like collaborating with other organizations that are trying to do similar kinds of work? Yeah, so in the US there's the Citizen Science Association, that's our professional organization of all the different citizen science efforts, because if you go to citizenscience.gov there's over 400 projects, and many are in-person environmental monitoring type efforts, um, but several are online type efforts like, like ours and, and others. iNaturalist is a major one in, uh, in sort of ecology, it's a mobile app based effort where you can just take a picture of any animal, plant, uh, insect, and get that tagged by a community, and then that goes into an international database. Um, so it's all about how do you engage the public in real and meaningful, valuable ways. Uh, and that community is so open, and we're just a bunch of Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, so they're like trying to make the world better, and so there's, 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 some, there's always some competition because we're so grant funded, um, but inherently all of us have that philosophy of how can we just lift all boats together and so there's it's very collaborative community um, there are existing other transcription efforts they their model is slightly different so we think it's important that in any ecosystem you're trying different things and seeing what gives quality results or what is the particular use case or research case for this and which platform is best for it so i'll send people to other platforms when i don't think zooniverse is quite the right fit um, so the smithsonian for example has a really good transcription interface um, and just a different model of approach. So we're doing research studies to understand which, what are the gains and strengths and weaknesses of the different ones. If that helps. Thank you. So my question is, um, with so many different projects on the site, I'm sure some get more volunteers working for them than others. I was just curious to see if you have any thoughts on what makes one project more likely to have volunteers working for it versus one not having volunteers for it. I mean, another statistic of launching what, within the, the one site within the, the first hour, 70,000 people were on it, I assume that there was, you know, it wasn't like incentivized for people to go on, those, was, those were people who were passionate about that project. I can't imagine that every project has that kind of, um, you know, starting, starting frenzy. Yeah, there was a great study, so <laughs> we have 150 peer-reviewed publications that have come out of Zooniverse projects, and then a whole set of metadata studies. So there's crowdsourced researchers who are just interested in the platform to learn best practices and lessons from it. Uh, one of the studies was from a group of economists who looked at Zooniverse and were trying to understand, well, how do, you, how do you get engagement versus not? The most important factor is the research team being engaged with their volunteers within the discussion forum. The more the research teams are feeding back, oh, these are intermediate results, oh, we just thought of this, and, and that dialogue is really rich, the more there, there's a bit of a uh, distribution of how the population interacts. About half the classifications come from dabblers, meaning people who just do a few on, on any given project, and half the classifications come from people who are deeply, deeply engaged and kind of grow their identity around that particular project. So th that second half become more deeply engaged because of that discussion forum engagement from blog posts and so social media posts. The other way some projects just get a lot of traffic is they get some kind of media hit. So we have a few NASA-led projects and NASA just has this PR engine and they get tens of thousands of volunteers with any big article that comes out when Backyard Worlds, which is this search for Planet Nine but really search for uh, brown dwarfs, has, has discovered dozens of new brown dwarfs, um, which might not necessarily mean a big headline, but when it's NASA pushing just the interesting discovery opportunity, that drives traffic. Um, Planet Hunters is another great project because there's this potential for discovery. Um, there it's a uh, Kepler and now test data looking at uh, the dips in the light curves of stars due to a planet passing in front of the star. 
and there are dozens of new exoplanets found every six months or so. And so if you go to that project, you have a pretty high likelihood of being one of the discoverers of a new planet around a distant star, which is a, is a trip. Um, you know, it's just a very unusual uh, experience to offer the public.